I invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 17 as we hear from God's word this morning, as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word and what the Holy Spirit would lead us into. We begin with prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would open them to receive God's word and to hear his truth. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they would have calmness and peace in both heart and mind to hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of God's word this morning. And lastly, I ask that you pray for me that I would proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ risen from the dead for all to be saved and redeemed. Psalm 19 says, let the words of my mouth and meditation my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Acts chapter 17 is one of these most amazing stories in the New Testament. It's this wonderful interaction of the Apostle Paul with a group of people who do not believe in Jesus, who do not know what the Bible says about Jesus, and who are very skeptical and have lots of doubts about who Jesus is and what this idea of the resurrection is. And so what I want to do today is go through this story of Paul proclaiming the Gospels into that type of community and environment and for us to learn how we as followers of Jesus can follow in Paul's example to share the Gospel with as many people as we can. So Acts chapter 17, where we begin in verse 16. So Paul was waiting for them, that is, um, his friends and ministry partners at Athens, and his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So just so you know, idols have always existed, right? So one of the great questions that people will ask one another or they'll ask a pastor or or some philosopher is, is the world getting better or worse? Let's just play a game. Show of hands, how many of you are, you just given up and you think it's getting worse and it's going to hell in a handbag? Anybody? Or maybe you wake up one day and you're just like, that's how I feel. All right, now let's find all the optimists in our church. (laughs) How many of you think at least it's got a shot to get better? right? A lot less hands. We're a lot less confident on that one, right? Now, what they've done is lots of psychology journals and things have done studies about this phenomenon. Is is the world getting better or worse? When was the best time to be alive? What they found is that everybody gives the exact same answer, all right? Everybody gives the same answer no matter what their age is, no matter how old or young they are, that the best time to be alive was always between when they were 10 and 20-something. So if you're in your 80s, you still say, it was back when I was between 10 and 20-something. If you're in your 30s, you go back and go, yeah, I was between like 10 and 20-something. Right? And you're, you're 40. right, so what we're saying is, it was good back then, and it's kind of getting worse. Now, here's why I bring this up. We tend to think that way. It's getting worse, and look at all these people, and look at all the idols, and look at all the sin, and destruction, and evil, and wickedness in the world. And we think, you know what is a good time? If we could just go back to, not when we were 10 or 20, but let's just go back to the early church. Let's go back then when everybody believed. Right? And I've heard people say this and act this way. Like, we'll just go back when everything was good. Everybody loved God and loved Jesus. And what that tells me is you haven't actually read your Bible. Because, <laughs> like, in chapter 3 of your Bible, we've already decided to not love God. Like, we had two good chapters. And then we were like, mm, we're doing it our way. We're going to create our own idols. So if you go back to the day of Paul, you're like, oh, it's going to be so great. What is the first thing we're told about that he sees in Athens? 
It's full of idols. It's full of people who do not love Jesus, who do not go to church, who do not worship God. So here's the reality. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. And Solomon was right. We're still full of idols. We're still full in our own hearts and in the world of chasing after everything else other than God to be our God. Now, here's the first step into sharing the gospel. You and I have a choice to make. Because Paul stood in Athens, and he looked around, and what did he find? A city full of idols. A city full of people rejecting God, rejecting God's word, not believing in Jesus, not believing in the resurrection, right? All those things that so many times as Christians we complain about, we lament about, we go, oh, look how bad the world is getting. And if we could just go back to filling your favorite decade, everything would be better. Just to let you know, dear friends, even during your favorite time to be alive, even during your favorite decade, guess what the world was still full of? Idols. So you have a choice. You and I have a choice on how we respond when we look at the world, when we join Paul looking at the city and going, oh, it is full of idols. Your first choice is to do what many of us do in sinfulness, which is to look down with contempt and arrogance and judgment and think, what is wrong with these people? Right. I remember one time riding in the car with some family members who I will not name. <laughs> and it was a Sunday morning. I think it was Easter or around Easter time. We were driving around going to church because that's what you do. You get the whole family together, right, on those special days and you go to church. And someone in the car lamented seeing a person working in their yard not going to church and lamented by going, isn't it a shame that they're not going to church on Easter to worship Jesus? Now, you got to understand, sarcasm is the native language of my family, and it took me a very long time. Some would say I'm still learning how to not <laughs> do it. <laughs> and to just don't say it. And so I piped up, well, why don't you get out of the car and go invite them? Nobody got out of the car, and I got to talking to. <laughs> another example of this. I was serving at another church. I will not name and it was Monday, Thursday. We were getting ready for worship, and there was a lot of people in the sanctuary helping prepare the sanctuary for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter services. And it's the biggest week of the year as Christians, right? We're, we're so happy and thrilled to be celebrating these wonderful moments with Jesus. And this church had soccer fields nearby, like right across the parking lot. And it's getting closer and closer to worship. And guess what's happening on the soccer field? Lots of families and lots of people doing what? Playing soccer and sports and celebrating. And I remember someone came up to me, remember I'm still learning, <laughs> and said, isn't it a shame that none of those people are coming to church to worship? And I said in all of my of amazing wisdom and wit, isn't it a shame that you haven't invited them? Now, I still think it was the right thing to say. I'm not saying that it went over well. But do you understand what I'm saying? Paul looks at the city of Athens, and he sees what? Hearts filled with idols. People not making God and Jesus and the worship of him a priority. And he has a choice on how he can respond to that reality. And you and I live in a place because human nature has not changed in 2,000 years where people are still filled with idols. 
and an ignorance and an ignoring of God and Jesus and his worship and praise. And just like Paul, you and I have a choice on how we can respond. And one response is to be like that and just throw up our hands in disgust or maybe arrogance and judgment of thinking, I am better than you, I am superior to you. Isn't it a shame that you are not like me? We can respond that way. Now, before we get to the other way to respond, I'm going to read you some Bible verses, and I'm just curious to see how many of these you agree with. All right, ready? So first one, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Show of hands, how many of you like that one? How many of you agree with it? I think it's good. Okay, just remember that. Got a few more here. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Like every Lutheran's favorite passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. How many of you like that one? How many of you agree with it? You're just like, amen. It's all about grace, right? I don't have to do anything. Jesus did it all. Amen. That is great and true and wonderful. All right. Another one you may not be as quite familiar with, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. St. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. How many of you are still in agreement with what the Bible says? All right. Last one, just for fun. Acts chapter one, verse eight. This is Jesus speaking to the church, the disciples after his resurrection. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Show of hands, how many of you agree with Jesus? There's a little, it's a pressure question, right, in church. Here's what I think. Those first few verses I read are near and dear to most of our hearts. It's John 3, 16, y'all, right? Everybody knows that one. Everybody knows it. It is God sending Jesus because of what? He loves the whole world. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's all about God's grace. It's not about how good we are or how bad we are. It is all about Jesus and his grace and his love for us because he loves the whole world, right? And in Romans 10, Paul says, all you have to do is believe in Jesus and believe that he died and rose from the dead and you will be what? Saved. It's all about Jesus. It's all about his grace. It's all about his love for the whole world. It's all about his death and his resurrection. And hearts and Christians all around the world join together and going, amen, praise God for that gospel truth. And Jesus also said, Acts 1, verse 8, that I'm going to empower you to be my witnesses in all the cities and all the places in the world. So here's the choice we have to make. We could respond, just judge other people, like I can't believe they don't believe John 3, 16. I can't believe they don't know and love Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9 like I do. I can't believe they're not talking about Jesus dying and rising from the dead and believing in him. It's ridiculous. We can, we can respond that way with arrogance and pride and judgment. Or we could respond the way that Paul did, which is to begin out of love, sharing the gospel with the people whose hearts are filled with idols, of sharing the gospel with people who don't know who Jesus is. They don't know John 3, 16. I know we joke that everybody knows it. I'm telling you, friends, not everybody actually knows it. 
And Lutherans, we joke all the time, oh, it's, it's everybody's favorite verse. Everybody knows Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and they're wonderful truths. But I'm telling you, dear friends, not everybody knows that truth of God's grace for them in Jesus. And so we can either respond and go, what a shame. I can't believe they're being like that. I can't believe they're following idols. Or we can follow the example of Paul. His heart is provoked. But it's not provoked to judgment and condemnation. It's provoked to love and serve and to share the gospel. So verse 17, Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So he is going to both Jews and Gentiles. He's going to everybody and anybody he can find, right? I love that it says just anybody who happened to be there. Right? He didn't have a target demographic. His target demographic was human beings who needed Jesus. And his response to seeing all their idolatry was, I'm going to share the gospel with them. So I asked you, do you love those verses? Do you know those verses? Because here's the way we change and become more like Paul. It's that we have a genuine love for God. We have a genuine belief that Jesus, in John 3, 16, really meant what he said, which is Jesus was sent for who? The whole world. We could read it again, <laughs> all right? But Jesus came because God loves the whole world, all y'all, and all y'all out there. He doesn't just love Christians. He doesn't just love you. He doesn't just love the people that go to church and know the Bible and have the verses memorized. The God himself, Jesus himself says what? He loves the whole world. That includes, in Paul's day, the people of Athens with a city filled with idols. It also includes our city filled with idols. It includes the whole world filled with idols. What motivates Paul is a love for God a love for God's word, and a love for people to know the love of Jesus. So in verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So there's two things here to learn from Paul before we get into the final point. The first is we have to have a genuine love for people who don't believe in Jesus. We have to love them enough to be provoked in our hearts to go and share the gospel because the only way they're gonna leave their idols behind is to what? hear about Jesus. The only way they're gonna stop mowing their lawn on Sunday morning, get in the car with my family, and go to church is if someone tells them about who? Jesus. The only way they're gonna get off the soccer field and come across the parking lot is if someone shares the message of Jesus with them. So the first step to sharing the gospel in the world and in your city and in your neighborhood, no matter how many idols it seems like it's filled with, is to simply care and to say, I love you enough, I care enough about you, I want you to know the grace of Jesus and the love of Jesus for you. Here's the second thing that we need to do you actually have to share the name of Jesus. I know that's astounding to you. <laughs> but we live in a day and age where most people view evangelism as offensive. Right? You can believe what you want to believe as long as you what? You keep it to yourself. It's just between you and God and nobody else. You're not bothering anybody else or anything like that. We also live in a day and age because we're afraid to say the name of Jesus that we think, I will just be nice enough to you that you will figure it out. Am I wrong? Right? 
If I just be kind enough to you and nice enough to you without ever mentioning the name of Jesus, you'll figure it out. And no, they won't. Now, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is a wonderful verse, right? It tells us that we're saved by grace and not by what? Works, doing good things. Here's what I need you to understand. You are not saved by your good works. You are saved by the grace of Jesus. And so is your neighbor. They will not be saved by your good works. They will only be saved by the grace of Jesus. And so what does Paul do? He gets up and he goes to the Jews and he goes to the Gentiles and he goes to the Epicureans, he goes to the Stoic philosophers and he begins talking to them. And then Luke says, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. He was actually sharing the gospel. So step one is to say, I love people enough that I want them to know the love of Jesus. Step two is telling them about Jesus. All right, so how do we do that? Let's learn from the Apostle Paul of how do we do this. So in verse 19, they took him and brought him to Areopagus, Mars Hill saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So just like Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun, there's nothing new under the sun. How many of you pay attention to the news? And it's like, yeah, okay, sure, I'll listen to it. And then you're like, five minutes in, how many of you are like, why am I doing this to myself? Right? And you pay attention online, and you see arguments and conversations back and forth and back and forth, and everybody's talking, and everybody's talking, and everybody's arguing, and everybody's trying to make a point of this way is better, no, this way is better, this way of thinking is better, this way of doing things is better, right? Any of you ever noticed, because you get stuck in line sometimes, and there's all these magazines there that they're tempting you to buy, Right? Does anybody ever look at the titles of those? I mean, I know we have phones now, so we're just like, well, I'll just pass the time on my phone. But sometimes I look at those titles, and what I've realized is it's always telling you and trying to convince you of what? Something new that will make your life better. And after a while, I began to notice it's always a list of something. Sometimes the list is like seven things and then 10 things, and then I've seen them get up to 30 and 40, and my goodness, if I gotta do 40 new things to make my life better, guess what I'm not gonna do? Make my life better. I'm just gonna quit on number two and call it a day, right? And then you go back the next week and the next month, and guess what you'll find? 30, 20, 10, 40 new things, because guess what? Apparently the old ones didn't work out. So we're not really that different from the day and age of Paul. What are they doing? They're getting together. They're talking a lot. They're sharing a lot. They're arguing and fighting and debating a lot all about what? The best way to do politics, the best way to live, the best religion, the best this, the best that, the best worldview, the best way to make your own life. And this is the environment that Paul steps into as a missionary and evangelist. So in verse 22 Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. So here's one of the most important steps you will ever take in sharing the gospel, what we learn from Paul here. He observes the people around him. He pays attention. He listens. The Bible says, be slow to speak and quick to listen. And in all of our wisdom as human beings, guess what we tend to do? Reverse it. <laughs> like, I've got something to say. I've got more things to say. And you ought to be listening to me, not me listening to you. But here's the deal. If you want to be a good evangelist like Paul, we're going to have to learn how to observe and listen to the people around us. And then he calls them very religious. And again, I want you to understand, not a lot has changed. We still live in a very religious world, very religious culture. 
We just don't call it that. People will now say, I'm spiritual, right? And if you pay attention to studies and, and news articles and things like that, you'll probably have seen all the panicked reports about the rise of the nuns, people putting down that they have no affiliation with religion anymore or a specific one. But if you actually do deeper dive into the research and the studies and you talk to people, what you'll find is it's not that they are atheists, they are more often than not agnostic, meaning I'm not sure. I'm spiritual, I'm open to things, we're religious, all right, but I'm just not sure of it. So you and I live in a world that is not very different from the Apostle Paul. In verse 23, says, For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also on an altar this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So what is he doing? He's observing, he's paying attention, and he's listening. And he's finding a world that is not any different than ours. He's saying, look at all of your objects of worship. Look at all of your idols, look at all of your worship. And just be like us, because they don't wanna be offensive, they don't wanna say this is the one true God, they just wanna keep all their options open, what did they do? They made a statue and engraved on it what? This is our idol for the unknown God. <laughs> what they're saying is, well we know all of these gods, and we know all of these philosophies, but we're not totally sure if we figured them all out, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make an idol a place of worship to any of the ones we, we forgot about, we don't know about. And our world is so very much like that. People are very spiritual, they are very religious, they are exploring, right? People are gathering together, they're going online and they're debating about this is the best way of life, this is the best worldview, this is a new philosophy, right? How many of you have ever gone online on social media and seen someone making a testimony about something that has now changed their life and then they now want to share it with you, right? Like this is all, this is the new thing, this new study, this new way. What are we doing? We're doing exactly what they did here in Athens around Paul. We've got all of these options for you. Find out the one that works best for you. And you know what? We even got a statue and an idol for the unknown God just in case you're uncertain, in case you don't want to cause offense. So Paul observes this, and he sees their need for something more. And he goes back to step two, which is he now tells them about Jesus. Right, he doesn't tell them, hey, your issues that you're a bunch of idolaters, or you're he tells them, hey, you're really religious. Hey, you really do worship. You are very spiritual. But I wanna tell you what you don't know. I'm gonna tell you about the one true God versus all these other gods. I'm gonna tell you about the one true way to life versus all these other worldviews and all these other philosophies and all these other ways of life. Because it is better. Because if you live your whole life based on doubt and uncertainty, guess what you're going to have all the time? Doubt and uncertainty. Does God love me? Am I good enough? Am I worthy enough? And so Paul comes in with the good news of the gospel and he says, let me tell you about a God you can actually know. You don't have to live with doubt. You don't have to live with uncertainty. You can know for a fact that you are loved and redeemed and valued. So he says in verse 23, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. He determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. So how is he describing God? He's describing God as he is the creator. He is the one who gives you life and breath and everything. That is a description of a good and loving and generous God versus all the unknown gods, 
all the uncertainty of this is now the new way, this is now the better way. Oh, that way didn't work, so here's the new thing to try. He's saying, no, no, no. With this God, the God of the Bible, you can know that he is good and kind and generous to you because he gives you life and breath and everything. And then the next thing that Paul teaches them about God, in verse 27, he says, yet he is not actually far from each one of us. What does that mean? He's not a distant, absent God. For the Athenians in that day, they would go to these temples and they would go to these idols, but it was kind of assumed that the gods were indifferent to the world. They were indifferent to their lives. And so you would make the sacrifices and you would make the prayers, but it was always this half-hearted, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, I don't know for sure, because they're distant, they're absent from our world, they're indifferent to us. And Paul describes Jesus in the God of the Bible as saying, but he's actually near to you. He is not far off. And then at the end, in verse 31, but he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. See, when we share the gospel and the good news of Jesus, we are sharing something that is totally unique in the world. We are sharing the good news of a God who is generous and kind to all, who gives life and breath and everything to all people. As Paul says, he is near and there for all people. He's not distant or absent or indifferent. And in a world filled with uncertainty and doubts and struggles of am I good, am I loved, am I worthy of God's love? Paul says, here is assurance that you can trust in. He raised Jesus from the dead, right? Isn't that what verse 31 says? He has given assurance to all by raising Jesus from the dead. This is the message that we share with the world, that you can have assurance that God really does love you, that John 3, 16 is not just for the good church people, but it's actually for you, that God's grace in Ephesians 2 is actually for you, and the response of, well, how can I know that for sure, Paul says, is because Jesus rose from the dead. And if God has done that for you, there's nothing he can't or won't do for you. But here's my hope and prayer for you and for us as a church, that like the Apostle Paul, our hearts would be provoked, but not towards condemnation, and judgment and disdain, but by towards love for people who need to hear the good news and the love and grace of Jesus, and that we would go out into the world and proclaim to them, you can know for certain that God loves you because Jesus has risen from the dead. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. We give thanks that you have risen from the dead to give us and all people the assurance and the promise and hope of eternal life with you, knowing that because you lived and died on the cross and rose from the dead, we too shall live because our sins have been forgiven by your grace and mercy. Holy Spirit, may you empower us and embolden us to go into the world filled with so many idols and doubts and uncertainties and proclaim to them the good news of Jesus' love and resurrection from the dead. In your name we pray, amen.